We are live. Hello, welcome. If you are watching us on our Facebook page, I'm Mark from the Staff Ken team. Uh, I've got an amazing panel of industry professionals today um, from various different sectors of the industry and geographically from all around the country, which is fantastic. Today, we're going to be talking about driving consumer confidence back into the market and basically getting bums on seats and trying to understand what businesses and people are gonna to have to do to do that. So let me start by introducing the panel. I appreciate that some of you looking at this will have a different screen placement than I have, but in my top left, I'm gonna start there is Paul Hackett. Paul, hi. Hi, thank you Give for having me. an introduction, me. Paul. Hi, yeah, um, I'm Paul, Paul Hackett. I work for the AA. Um, I've been lucky enough to have worked for the AA for 21 years. Um, some would consider that hard time, but certainly not. Um, I, um, prior to working at the AA, I've worked in various uh, hotels and um, I started off as a chef. So uh, classically trained, city and guilds qualifications. I was a chef for a few years, then went to Bournemouth University, uh, studied hospitality management, and then, yeah, a career in hotels and then with the AA for 21 years. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, moving down is uh, is Jamie Shell. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jamie from uh, Rothley Manor Hotel and Restaurant in the Lake District in Ambleside. We've been here for just over four years. In fact, I think it was pretty much dead on four years the day we were closed down. Um, so, yeah, it was a fairly strange time. Very strange time. And moving across, uh, Mike Robinson. Oh, yes, I'm Mike Robinson. Um, I own a restaurant in Stratford-on-Avon called The Woodsman, which opened about a year ago. Um, I co-own a restaurant, a pub restaurant in Fulham called The Harwood Arms, and started that uh, about 11 years ago, I think, 10 or 11 years ago. And uh, I'm about to open in September, which is something exciting and challenging, a restaurant in Bath called The Elder. Good luck with that. Uh, moving around to my right is uh, Marcos, hello. Hi, I'm Marcus Fernandez. I'm a very good customer of the Hardwood Arms. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favourite restaurants in London. Um, I'm the managing director of Iberica Restaurants and Arroz QD. Uh, we do Spanish food. I'm associated to two chefs, Nacho Manzano from Asturias with uh, a total of three Michelin stars. Uh, for Iberica, we have uh, seven restaurants, uh, four in London, three outside of London. And recently, uh, six months before closed down, we had uh, just opened a Ross QD, which is a um, restaurant focused on rice fire and the cooking of Kike da Costa, which is uh, one of our top okay. chefs in Spain, in, in, in Valencia. He has a total of uh, now five Michelin stars. So he's got a three and a two. Um, and that's a, a project that um, we, were, we are hoping to then take internationally. Because it's, it's a project more focused than much larger cities like London, because it's higher end. And, um, and today I'm changing my name to McGiver after managing, managing to work my way out of this situation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Brilliant. Thank you. And last, but absolutely by no means least, Anna Hogg. Um, hi, I'm Anna. I'm the head chef and owner of Myrtle Restaurant, which is a modern Irish uh, restaurant in Chelsea. Um, it opened up only about a year ago. Um, so, yeah, it's been kind of like a, a fun, exciting year, um, but a sad way to kind of finish it. We didn't even get to ring in our, our anniversary um, open. And uh, we're also launching a, a new brand called Anna's Bistro, which is launched on the 4th of July. So it's delivering um, kind of familiar French dishes um, to your door, or we also do like a takeaway and collection. Brilliant, listen, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for being early. <clears throat> so first question to the panel, and I don't know who wants to start first. Obviously this is about consumer confidence. Um, we're seeing restaurants open. We're seeing lots and lots of people booking. Is there an appetite then for people to go back to your restaurants? Is this a short term thing, do you think? Or is there now confidence in the market that people are going to book and they're going to continue to book and we're going to see restaurants back to a pre-COVID level? Does anyone want to start? I can, I can, I can give you a bit of a view of how we are thinking about it. Um, Please do, Marcos. There's no, there's no crystal ball. I, don't, I think that if we had yeah. a crystal ball, 
we would all be very busy right now. Um, it's, um, I think that consumer confidence in the next 12 months has uh, actually three uh, different uh, influences and will affect in different times, different segments of, um, of the uh, restaurant market. So if you look at the typical bell curve that will uh, represent anything in a society from extreme right to extreme left or anything like that, you know, it's, it's a curve that the, at the extremes and then you would go and normally society will be in that center. Um, and I think that at this moment, we, we've had uh, on the x-axis, you would have um, someone who's very scared and someone who's not concerned at all, who has absolutely no risk um, or no perceived risk. Um, and there's been people on both extremes, and most of us have been on a, on a, on a kind of tight curve within we are slightly scared. And that curve has been now shifting to the right, which starting to be less scared, but also it will, it will flatten. There will be people that will uh, remain scared, they, and then you know, people will go to being less scared in different uh, speeds. Um, and I think that also that's obviously going to have a very big relation to age. So uh, depending on what age group, but I mean, there was an article in the BBC recently where the risk of anyone below 50 of dying of COVID is exactly the same risk as the one that you've got when you open the door and leave your house every day. Yeah. It's 0 0.1. So really there isn't a true risk for the customer in general of this being a, a thing. It's, it's, it's what it does to a, a certain segment of our society. But then, so that's, that's a, a curve that it's going to increase uh, the amount of consumers that we have. But then on the other side, a new effect will start coming, which is the effect of lockdown, the uh, recession. So you'll have more and more people feeling the bite and that will start taking customers out um, and I'm, I'm slightly more concerned, actually. Um, there's a third point is, is the amount of people that will return to um, the offices and when. But again, that won't affect all restaurants equally. So if, if uh, let's say, a bank is um, now having people hot desking and only coming twice a week, before you would have someone that goes to his office five times a week, buys sandwiches three times, and goes out for a for a meal, a business meal twice a week. I doubt that the twice a week that he'll come now will be the sandwich day. He'll probably make it coincide with the restaurant day. So I think that probably um, less customers will affect a restaurant like Iberica less than probably Pret because Pret lives of those sandwiches that won't happen. Yeah. Right? So I mean, yeah. so it doesn't depend <clears throat> when you are and how that is. Um, we've we've. Um, We've made use of all the um, articles that McKinsey has made public during the COVID, which are really useful. And they give you very, very good scenarios um, of growth. You know, and they're going, well, you'll be at 100% by Christmas or 100% by Christmas next year. So we're estimating 100% by July. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah, no, you There's you're, a you're... moment that only that works. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have any more data. You're, you're right. None of us have a crystal ball. I mean, Jamie, Mike, uh, Anna, you've all, you're all operators. Are, you, are, you, are your reservations open? Um, what is the response like <clears throat> been at the moment? Do you want to start uh, as you're my bottom left, Jamie? Do you want to start with that one? Yeah, so uh, we aren't opening the doors of the hotel until the 16th. We thought we'd give it a couple of weeks. Um, but reservations... Is that because you want to see what happens? Sorry to interrupt you. Do you no, want no, to sort it's... of... Do you want to see what happens? Is that why you've delayed it a couple of weeks? Uh, initially, we made a call to delay it to the 16th, not knowing that we were going to be allowed to open on the 4th. Okay. Um, we felt that being a hotel as well as a restaurant, we would find that we would be treated a bit like non-essential retail and get pushed back two weeks. Okay. And we, had, we wanted to make a call on a date to try and give some people who wanted to book some kind of confidence that we were going to be here. Yeah. Um, a lot of said to us they weren't prepared to book until we'd actually opened the doors. But having a date of opening was enough to get some. So our booking started, we opened bookings about two weeks ago. And it's been a slow trickle, but it's picking up. And, and surprisingly, I thought the lockdown in Leicester would start having an effect, actually, and start pulling, making people pull back. But the phone has not stopped ringing this morning. Um, and there are three of us in, and we've all been on the phone, and the phone is still ringing. And That's almost everyone news. is booking. And... 
as far as the hotel side of it's concerned, they are all booking for longer than they would normally. Uh, so instead of the one or two nights, we're now looking at four, five, six, seven nights. So is the staycation going to benefit you? Uh, it appears as though it is at the moment. I hope it continues. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I know normally, normally about now for July and August, we should be around 80 to 90 percent occupancy. And I think July and August have just hit about 35 to 40 percent because we've just missed four months of our prime booking window for that period of time. Yeah. But it is picking up and it's picking up consistently. It's not sort of sporadic, which is good. So it's consistent build through at the moment, looking towards when we're opening, which is um, giving us some good confidence at the moment. Brilliant. It's fantastic. Mike, you're obviously you've got a restaurant in Stratford, restaurant in London. Are you seeing any different patterns? So London, we're holding off for a little while because the size of the space means that with any form of social distancing, it's probably difficult to operate it without losing money at the moment. Yeah, I think that we're looking at um, reopening as soon as we humanly can. So I wouldn't I couldn't say a date, but it'll be pretty soon. Yeah. Um, Stratford, the woodsman, fascinating town. Um, obviously a very big tourist destination and we are right in the center opposite Shakespeare's house in a lovely old 15th century hotel, the Hotel Indigo. Now that hotel was only after a five year renovation was finished and I'm, I'm kind of the restaurant partner to the hotel. So I'm an independent restaurant within a hotel. And um, they have seen amazing bookings um, over the last couple of weeks coming into the hotel, which is fantastic. And likewise, I opened my books for reservations four weeks ago, like based on the fourth, hoping it wouldn't change in it, you know, thank God. And uh, yeah, we've had, Craigie, we've had, I suppose it's going crazy right now. Our restaurant managers on the phone. I've opened the reservations initially just on telephone so that Rachel can speak to people, explain it to them, be a human voice, not just on uh, online. And people at the response, the human response to being able to come and book is enormous. Like, a real outpouring of we can't wait, you know? And, but I'm concerned for the town because the town is predominantly tourism, whereas our base is predominantly um, locals. We, we yeah. very much found we're a locals restaurant, quite a big place. Um, and, uh, and of course there's other factors, for example, theaters. Stratford-on-Avon, the Royal Shakespeare Company Theater, 1500 people a night. The, the effect on the town's economics is huge they may not reopen till next year. And that affects a lot of the smaller restaurants in town that, that do it. So we seem to be in a really good place and uh, with a, we are blessed with, the, with space. And I think that's a big call too. I think there's a real lottery as to the, the, the physical size of the space that you operate in, how hard or easy this is going to be economically going forward. Yeah. And we're very blessed with space. Space means you can space and open early. I think the ones that are saying let's hold off a little while are fully understandably smaller, tighter, hard to operate. You just can't deliberately operate at a loss. That's what it boils no. out to. No, absolutely. Absolutely. No, especially after being through what everyone's been yeah. through, which has been economically a really, really tough time. Anna, you're obviously in London. Now, London relies on international trade. It relies on uh, a busy city. You know, London, London is a hub. And, you know, Marcos mentioned earlier, People aren't going to work. You know, the advice from the government is still work from home if you can. So that's a lot of white collar workers will all be working from home. How are your reservations going and what do you sort of foresee for the future? Um, well, we opened just, I think about two days ago, we opened uh, for reservations because the restaurant will open on the 18th of July. And I don't really have a choice. I have to open, you know, I still have to pay rent. Um, so I need to bring in money. So when, you, to sorry, to when you say you have to, that's a commercial reason that you have to open. Well, I have to pay my rent and yeah. unless I'm bringing in money, I mean, I won't be able to pay my rent. Yeah. Um, I was really worried about opening up in July because I felt that perhaps people wouldn't be keen um, to eat out. My sister lives in Spain, so I got, I got to witness her kind of experience of, of when they lifted their lockdown and how slow the restaurants were there. She lives in Marbella. And she, it was a few weeks, easily three weeks before it, it really started to kind of gain its kind of atmosphere and, and more people were dining out. Um, but we've been quite lucky two days and our opening um, uh, a week is looking really busy. We're booked out, totally booked out on the Saturday. And then uh, I think we're kind of half full for the rest of the week. So for two days booking, it's, it's really good for a small restaurant like ourselves. 
lots of people coming back uh, to support us, lots of, and uh, we have like the nicest guests in the world. They're so nice. Um, so it's, re it's really exciting to know that you're gonna see these people again and, and that they're excited um, to be back in your restaurant. There's something really special about, um, you know, that, that feeling. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how customers are going to feel um, in the restaurant when they come back with the idea that there's less people, you know, less tables. Um, we're also, you know, we have different things that we're implementing that the service will be slightly different. So we're trying to reduce how often the waiter goes to the table as much as possible. We want to kind of feel, you know, there's like an invisible safety kind of procedures um, in action while they're there so that they feel we're taking care of them. And it's quite complicated trying to take care of all of that. Yeah, brilliant. Very much. Thank you. I mean, very, very positive news um, early on. So um, ne next question for you all. We've, as, as some of you have identified, some restaurants are choosing to uh, wait a little bit. Some restaurants are saying not just yet. We've already seen um, Leicester under lockdown. So do you think these things are gonna have a potential impact on consumer confidence? And Paul, let me bring in you. What, what are you as the AA saying to your, your members, the hotels that, that, that you look after that appear in your guys? What's your kind of blanket advice to the industry? I, I think the first advice has to be, you, you must follow the government guidance. Uh, that, that, that's where it's got to start. Um, and there is some fantastic guidance out there. I, I've read quite a lot over the last sort of few months. Um, there's some fantastic papers from UK Hospitality. Uh, there's lots of good international advice. I, I think you've got to listen to uh, what the government and what the professionals are saying. Um, that, 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 that's, that's first and foremost. Um, I really wish there was a crystal ball, but there's not. Um, and I think everybody has to um, use their own judgment as well to a certain degree. And touching uh, upon some of the, the, the points of the last question, um, I think there's a lot of pent up demand out there for people to get back into hotels and restaurants. Absolutely. And if, if many people are like me, I can't wait to get into a restaurant. I really can't. I can't wait to get into London. I can't wait to get around the country. Um, and, and that's my choice. And I think the consumer has a large part to play in, in, in this whole picture as well. Um, and I think we have to give ourselves a pat on the back and realise you, you know, some of these procedures, they're not alien to us. You, you, you know, good food hygiene is at the core of what we do day in and day out. Yeah. Creating a clean environment is at the core of what we do day in and day out. And COVID is, is here and it's different and we're adapting to it as an industry. Um, but I think the key thing is follow the guidance, uh, do a really good risk assessment. I think that is critical. Um, look at your business, look at those touch points, see uh, what works. Um, I mean, the buzzword from Boris Johnson was common sense. I think we need to have a common sense approach. Um, everything that's coming out of government is guidance. It's not law, it's not legislation, it's guidance. And I think we as operators and we as, you know, all of us very good operators, um, we have to take confidence in knowing that we do a good job already and we can just build on that by uh, following, well, following guidance, having a good risk assessment, having really good procedures, really good practices in place. Um, and I think it's all about building confidence. And I think as long as we build confidence, uh, it's a good platform to jump off from. Um, obviously, Leicester is a concern. Um, there are some other uh, sort of areas across the UK which are also yeah. concerns. Um, I, I just hope that it doesn't blow up uh, as it has done in the past. I, I really, really sincerely hope that we've got this beat. Yep. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to come to, to Jamie and Mike now for maybe. Both of you said that you've been on the phones, you've been talking to your customers. Yep. Uh, which is which is fantastic. I think I think that human contact is is you know the starting point of of building confidence. When you're talking to customers, are they asking you you know what's different? What are you going to be doing? Are we going to be served in face masks? Are you getting that type of question or not? Yeah, we are. Yeah, 
I'll go, go after you. Go on. Go on Jamie, you go first. Sorry, I shouldn't have split that like that. Jamie, you go first. Yeah, yes, we are. Um, and actually, the feeling from most of them is they don't want to see change. They want to become away and feel like they're on holiday. They don't want to feel like they're being served by Darth Vader or whoever it might be behind the mask that they can't see a face. They want to have the interaction and be able to have a conversation with people um, without feeling that, that everything's changed. They want to come back to the hotel that they know and eat in the restaurant that they know. They don't want it to have changed. But they, at the same time, they do understand that there are going to have to be some changes and there are going to have to be things. They just don't want it to be too visible. Yep. Is that the same for you, Mike? Exactly. Um, I think the customers fall into a few different brackets. Um, I mean, we have probably 10% of the calls we're getting um, are asking some direct questions about how we're dealing with this or that or the other. And then, but most of them are saying exactly that. They're like, you know, we want to come out because we want the experience of going to a restaurant. They want to experience hospitality again. We've, we've had the press deluge us with doom and gloom for um, four months. Uh, you, uh, the, the, the feeling that if you go outside, you're going to die, um, you know, and, and actually, I think as Brits, we're a very resilient nation. We are very, um, we, we, we put our shoulders back and get on. And I think we're good in the face of danger. And I think at some point, people have to acknowledge that there will be a degree of risk if you go out and you choose to go outside, you are taking a bit of risk. Just like you said, you step out your front door and you walk across the road, you're engaging in a risky activity. Yeah, absolutely. We, absolutely. we as operators have taken huge, spent a lot of money, taken a lot of time creating risk assessments that are as good as we can do, that hopefully will allow people to come and all that will be in the background. They, they, it'll, they'll be informed, but they can still enjoy themselves. I do not want to go and eat in a restaurant where I'm in a booth with plastic screens around me with someone in gloves and a blue mask serving me food. It, it, I wouldn't go out to eat there. And Marcus, what about yourself? Uh, what what sort of steps are you taking? I mean, it's, it's a lot has been said already. Actually, um, I mean, we've got we've got um, very strong operating procedures and and most importantly, actually, training procedures. So we've been able to change to change our operations and start training our staff way before uh, we even thought about opening. Uh, but I think that there's. Um, real uh, reduction in risk and sorry and um, before i say that every restaurant that operates normally uh, should be able to tell with confidence and i don't think that um and i was saying that before lockdown because we were suffering lockdown before lockdown because mm. uh, obviously yeah, we went off to say that you shouldn't go to a restaurant two weeks before which is... I absolutely i had a week where people were told <laughs> not to go to restaurants but nothing was locked down which was a killer I won't um, go into, into the whole politics of, yeah. of if lockdown is the right thing or not, because I mean that's a, that's a different discussion altogether. But but it, it's it's um, we were we were already before lockdown. We had changed a lot of our procedures um, uh, to to not not only increase, for example, the, uh, the amount of times that people wash their hands, but the restaurants were covered with um, you know hand sanitizers both for customers and for. And people were actually commenting on that. And I think that there's, there's, there's the thing that every good restaurant can do is provide a very hygienic, safe place to eat. We are all extremely well trained and we all have loads of systems and a lot of tools that help us achieve that really, really quickly. But it's also dealing with the perceived risk. So, yes. for example, we're looking at things like putting cutlery in little paper bags. Um, does that reduce the risk of the spread of COVID? Absolutely not. Uh, but this, it does reduce the perceived risk. Um, and then it's, it's, it's how you play with these things of masks or not masks or, you know, because I do, I do understand that, that, that taking the face away of a waiter is one of the worst things that you can do. Um, but then again, there's going to be a lot of people that don't want people speaking to them without a mask. So that's, there we're still, we're still toying with different ideas. Um, initially, we were going to start with masks, but, but, but maybe we put those plastic things in front something like this. But the most important thing I think on restaurants is actually size. Our restaurants are all quite large. So giving, and we're already very ample. Uh, there was already one meter in between tables. Yes. Um, so adding, adding another meter for us, we lose 30% of our covers only, which we think we won't need in the next 12 months anyway. So, but the important thing for us is how do we achieve that without crushing the ambience? Mm. ambience doesn't go away you need to have ambience for a restaurant to work 
It's and a social environment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. You know, pe pe people break bread and drink wine. Anna, if I, if I come to Myrtle then, what, what changes have you made? I mean, am I going to be served with someone in a mask? Is there not going to be cutlery on the tables? What sort of changes have you had to make? Yeah, I, I, I feel guilty that I'm standing up and saying, yeah, my staff are going to wear masks, uh, not necessarily permanently. Um, but everywhere I, I go, I see people in masks. Um, it's advised that it is a good idea to wear a mask. Um, I think sometimes we can be a little bit vain that we think everybody is concerned about what we look like and all the rest. But when you're taking care of a table, your table isn't obsessing about you. They're, they're obsessing about the person that they're with and the company they're with. Um, so I think, you know, I know it's not necessarily comfortable and it is new to us. But yeah, we're, we're going to, to start with masks, um, nice masks, um, not surgical masks. Um, and we're, we're, we're trying to get deliveries in now to look at different styles uh, that are comfortable and, you know, that are kind of the, the, that my staff get to choose themselves. But I don't see anything wrong with it. And, and then if there comes a time and the government says, sure, you know, there's no point or don't do it, then we, we can stop. But I can't see a, a customer turning away from our business because we're trying to do the best thing we can for my staff and for them. Um, but we have lots of, you know, going through what, what the others were talking about, the risk assessments is incredibly important. Um, the, the frequency of what we clean and how we clean it. Um, again, we're not going to have the table fully laid when people arrive. Mm. So the, the system that has to be in place to efficiently lay a table, rest a, you know, a, 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 a group of people or, or, or a couple uh, down to get their drinks, their first drinks, and all of that kind of logistics are new. And, um, and I'm not going to lie, I'm afraid, but I'm excited at the same time because, you know, it will make, I think, the, the restaurant, you know, safer and hopefully more efficient once these things are in place. Um, but I, I think what we're trying to do is is the right thing like I, I I love my customers and I want them to always feel that when they come to Myrtle that I'm I really am putting them and my staff first so you know my staff are like customers to me that their health is as important um so yeah I, I don't really know what I'm doing I'm just kind of trying to figure it out and, and that's it you know we've already said there is no crystal ball so I think you know there are as, as Paul said there are guidelines but they're guidelines and and every individual operation has got to make those guidelines work is any of you concerned that obviously there's a cost involved to this you know masks you know table settings all of those type of things is is there a concern and I can perhaps understand why some people are sitting on the fence to wait and see what happens because you know you could put screens up, do all of these things. And suddenly in a month's time, they go, okay, we don't need screens now and we don't need this and we don't. And you go, well, I've just forked that X thousands of pounds for all of this. So are <clears> any <throat> of you concerned that, not that the guidelines are going to change, but you're investing in something that might change very quickly and the commercial impact could be negative on your business because, you know, whenever you buy something, there's always a period of time for it to be paid back. So are any of the changes you think are going to sort of restrict you commercially? I think a major change for us is, is staff cost for, for actually executing all these policies. Because um, yeah. you've got a smaller team. You've got a smaller team. They're having, we're doing the same thing, single use menus printed for every single service. Okay. Yeah. Put down when they start. Um, it, all these elements um, we're doing. And yes, I mean, that someone has to do all that. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And that is time and time is money and time is staff cost. Yeah. So, there will be an effect. I don't think any of us are expecting to, to do very well out of this industry in the short term after post reopening. Yeah. I, I don't know, everyone, I, I think we're expecting to get through so that we see a bright future down the line, you know? And, and uh... Jamie, are, are you, I've read things like, if I stay in a hotel room, you have to leave that room empty for 24 hours. Is that right? What, what sort of things do you have to do around, in and around hotel rooms? There is there has been nothing said about leaving hotel rooms empty that we've we've had. Um, it, we just need to be more aware of the cleanliness side of things, and the more of the touch points that need to be cleaned and kept clean. And then I think a lot of it comes back to the perceived risk as well. It's making guests feel that we are taking the steps. So when they arrive, they want to see that there are things that have changed in in front of them, so that they therefore know that the stuff that's being done behind the scenes is being done. 
if they walk into a hotel and there is nothing changed, that there is there is a screen at the reception desk so that the receptionist is safe and they are safe, they will imagine that nothing's been done anywhere. So it's about keeping the perceived risk. I, there, there is very little difference that we need to do. Our cleanliness was great, as I'm sure everyone else's is up beforehand. So moving forwards, it's no different. I know they've said about leaving a hotel room empty for 72 hours if you get a confirmed case in the hotel. But uh, okay. I'm probably I'm probably not going to know I've got a confirmed case until three days after they were here anyway. Yeah. So at that, that yeah. point, it's too late for me to leave it empty. Yeah. Um, Paul, coming back to you at the AA, I know you've launched a sort of COVID safe scheme, award scheme. To just talk us through how that works and how that can benefit people. OK, so we've li- we've launched um, our, our COVID confident mark. Um, we felt that the industry needed something to promote uh, customer confidence. Um, so we worked quite hard to produce something relatively quickly. Um, that has now been launched and we're very close to making our first uh, sort of approvals um, and issuing that mark. It is, um, it, it's across industry. So it's not just for hotels and restaurants, but it's for, uh, uh hmm. self-catering visitor attractions campsites golf um pubs um uh have i missed any um just looking at my notes here no i think that's most of them hotels restaurants um and what it is it, it's an opportunity for any of those establishments to go on to um rated trips so www.ratedtrips.com um if you're an existing customer um, there's a link to your establishment uh, there already. You just need your ID number. But if you're a new customer, and I have to say that this is open to, to everybody, so you don't have to be an existing AA customer. Um, you can be a pub that's never had anything to do with the AA. Um, so you basically create a username, um, email address, um, put your name, username, email address, and create an account Uh and, and then it's pretty much an online assessment. So the first part is, uh, we call it uh, key criteria. So we're asking for any establishment to upload their risk assessment, what procedures they're putting in place to combat uh, the, the, the sort of COVID. Uh, we're looking for all establishments that serve food to have a minimum score of three on their hygiene certificates and we're asking them to sign a code of conduct um that's the main thing um it's been designed to not be too arduous so the most arduous part is uploading your documents um and then after that we've got a secondary aspect which is just best practice and i have to stress we're not saying that you must wear face masks or you must do this or you should be doing that it's just best practice because there's so much really good best practice out there. It's a little bit like face masks. Um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong with face masks. Um, you know, in some in some respects, um, wearing a face mask presents a fantastic opportunity to your customer to know that you're taking some very visual steps into creating yeah. a, a much better environment. But yeah. equally, some people might just not want to want to do that. They might not need to broadcast the fact because they've just got fantastic standards in place. So depending on the scheme, um, there, there, there are a number of questions. Um, some schemes are a little bit bigger in terms of the questions than others, but I think the maximum number of questions is about 48. Um, so nothing too arduous and it's a simple yes, no or non applicable. Um, you tick those boxes or their little radio buttons. Um, and then at the end, there's a little bit of, there's a box where you can put some free flow content in there. If you're doing something that is unique to your particular establishment. Um, so you go through that process. Um, we then uh, ourselves, we look at that content with a view of either approving it or not approving it. Um, and for those that we approve, our aim is to uh, issue a certificate, uh, a logo uh, that you can advertise on your on your own website, on your menus. Uh, you can print off the certificate and put in a prominent place. It's really designed to uh, increase uh, customer confidence in your establishments. Uh, there's no cost. It's free. Um, 
that was our decision to try and give something back in these really, really difficult times. Um, and that's what we've done. Um, we've had quite a lot of take up already. Um, I think when I went onto the system today, uh, we've got in the region of around 3,000 uh, 3, users or 3,000 login, um, 3,000 people have logged in and created usernames. So it, it's growing and, and hopefully it will be a good thing for, for all pubs, all restaurants, all hotels. It's a little something that, that raises confidence and, and that can't be a bad thing at this time. No, I agree. And I think, you know, as, as a number of you have already said, it's that perceived risk, isn't it? You know, and, and, and you're right, Anna, you know, you, you sort of apologise for face masks. I think if you go in and someone's got a face mask on, it shows that you're actually taking something serious, in my opinion. So it, it does come Agreed. down to a lot of it is around mindset of people. Um, so in, in, in terms of um, how are you sort of communicating? I mean, we all use social media now. Um, how are you guys communicating to your audience and potential audience that you are safe and kind of breaking down that perception of it is safe to come and eat with me or come and stay with me? Do you want to start with that, Anna? Are you doing anything different with your marketing? Um, not at the moment. Um, I think we've been contacted by a few different kind of publications that want to know what our procedures are. So I'm assuming there will be more articles written on the subject. I, I think really what, what we wanted to be is that if somebody wants to dine, they will book. If somebody feels unsafe, I'm not trying to encourage them to book because you don't want somebody stressed. So what it is, is that once they come through the door, what I'm hoping is that they feel we're taking care of them, you know, that we're looking after them. Um, and then when other people who are a bit more anxious are ready and feel assured, well, then hopefully they will come through the door as well. But we're not trying to encourage anybody to dine out or, or to be out and about until they're ready. And I think that's really important. It's more about, you know, when you're ready, you're ready. And that's it. it this is a, um, about, you know, luxury and enjoying yourself. Like this is definitely not a necessity in your life. Um, and I, I only want people coming through the door who are absolutely all guns blazing, excited about having a, a delicious meal. Um, and I think that's really important. Agree. Marcos, what about yourself? Are you, are you doing anything different with your marketing? Hey, we're doing things different in marketing with products with a whole lot. I mean, we've launched um, three different um, at-home products, some for customers to cook, some some going into a market that we went in, and some to stop the uh, cannibalization. But um, even before COVID, we actually did do a lot of social media explaining measures that we were doing on wiping uh, high high touch point areas, for example. Uh, we will talk about a new figure that there's going to be in every restaurant, which is we're still trying to work out the title because it's a man with the wiping disinfectant. <laughs> so you need to find a proper title for him. But I mean, there's going to be something like that going on. And we will inform customers that those things are happening. But then a lot of the media as well is 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 exactly that. It's to try to create the excitement about it. So, I mean, we uh, have a one-year anniversary still to celebrate. We've got... Uh, um, uh, two new menus that haven't been launched and now we're going to launch you know so we're focusing a lot as well we are doing both things talking about why why restaurants are safe in general not just us and talking about um why is it good to come and and see us today and and uh for our outside seating for example we're doing a heavy campaign that's going to start now because in uh canary wharf i don't know if anyone of you have been to la terraza it was much more kind of casual fast eating and we've changed the concept completely because now that's prime area, that's prime restaurant. So we're we're looking at you know more kind of grilled meats and in a very Spanish way and grilled fish. There's a we've changed the whole kitchen, we've put jospers in. So there's a lot of advertising around that that's going to happen. Um, and then we've been we've been very active with um, with all the events that we used to do in in the restaurant. Uh, so you know. We used to have the uh, meet the makers and bring kind of the winemakers that we work with or uh, people that make our products or other chefs. Uh, and we've been keeping doing that as well throughout this whole thing. And actually, uh, we were selling, for example, for wine tastings, we will sell you the box with the four wines and more people were coming to the event through Zoom than in mm -hmm. the restaurant. Brilliant. People we'll buying tickets. Mm -hmm. so, We've been keeping in contact with our customers constantly, and we've been keeping also reminding them that of that simple fact, which is um, 
what's 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 been said here is that is that is that restaurants is probably one of the best trained establishments for hygiene yeah. that there are. I mean, yeah. I I recall having a conversation before lockdown with one of my customers saying, oh, I'm worried about coming to the restaurant. And I questioned him and I said, how many times do they wipe the table in your office? Because this table has been wiped at least eight times today. You know, so I think it's also yeah. explaining that and uh, yeah. that we've been doing throughout. Uh, Mike, you, you're up there in Stratford, and we know, we know Stratford well. We we've um, we do a, you know uh, with Paul Foster, uh, and as you said, it's 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 traditionally a um, a tourist town. You've obviously got the theatre there. So what what are you having to do in terms of your marketing to get people in to the Woodsman? <clears throat> I, I've, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, well, when our staff come back next week, all of our staff are back, because um, we're opening on the 8th. <clears throat> First thing I'm doing is making a short film using, using film, because I think it's a very good way of reaching out to people. So oh, I'm yeah. making a short film where I will walk through the entire space from kitchen, lose every single space, just sort of in a very friendly, nice way, going through the elements that we're doing to help keep them safe. So that it's, you can, when you go on to book, you can watch that and hopefully that will allay all your worries <clears throat> so that when you come, you, you turn up and you already know those things. So what we'll do is we'll email everybody and say, hey, here's a short film Mike's made just to show you the what goes on at the Woodsman and how you can feel comfortable when you're there. Um, I think I think the, the biggest deal is, is it, I think, as I said earlier, we're very blessed because everybody knows it's a large airy space with lots of rooms that we can move around it. If, as your restaurants get tighter and smaller and smaller, depending on the operator and the business, it's harder. You have, I think, you have to be more and more visible in 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 in, in what you're doing. I mean, we everybody must have a, a, a cast iron risk assessment for this. I mean, that's the main thing. And what we've done on that front is, when everybody books for the restaurant, we've sent them a a a, a list, uh, an email outlining all the salient points of how we're keeping them safe. So when they've actually booked their table or when they're inquiring about booking the table, bing, they get this. It's on our website, it's on our social media so that people can see all the points that are there. Because I really want people when they come, yes, to feel safe. I want to hit that balance that they feel super safe and cared for, but they also feel like they can actually let their hair down a little bit and enjoy the experience of hospitality again. And it's so hard because I believe when we do open and none of us know yet what it's going to be like, none of us are actually there yet. When we actually do open, the customers are going to let us know what they want. Uh, and yeah. it, it, I really believe yeah. that. So which if, they do in normal times. Yes. So, for example, the big the biggest single visible question is, I think, to mask or not to mask at the moment. I think that's the kind of main visible one. And. I think that um, I've had some really lovely ones made for our cocktail barman, for example, with lovely sort of Victorian deer, deer antlers and little things. So they look really friendly because we we operate one little thing. We have a, something that's very popular. We're very old fashioned. We've got a, a cocktail trolley that comes through the restaurant. And everybody loves it. We make Negronis. We make margaritas, martinis at the table side. And our risk assessment said, for example, when we did it, our five and a half hour risk assessment Zoom call, um, said to us, uh, you know, actually that's one of the things that's an issue because that person is spending a significant period of time in close proximity with a table. Um, so actually what we've done now is instead of uh, taking that to the table, that person will be masked in a very beautiful mask and they'll, the, the trolley will, will fill the restaurant up from one end to the other over the course of the evening and the trolley will start in a location at that end and make its way. So it'll only happen in two areas. So. We're trying to adapt, still keep the atmosphere, still keep the ambience, which is so key. Uh, as Marcus said, that 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 you go out to eat to be near other people. That's the great Absolutely. difficulty of this business. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You don't go out to eat to be on your own. So yeah. no. So yeah, we're we're using social media, we're using film, we're using that. I mean, you can you can make a really great film edited yourself Absolutely, on yeah. one of these yeah. for five minutes in half an hour yeah. walk around your restaurant. And let people know what's going on you know what a brilliant idea jamie i'll just uh, i'll finish on you but obviously in a hotel slightly different people are going to pass on stairways and um people are going to be there slightly longer than than being in a restaurant um so what are you doing in terms of your marketing and what's your sort of communication message to people that might be coming to you 
So it's much the same. A lot of it's going to be uh, through social media, having stuff on our own website, making sure they are aware as things change throughout the last few months, we've kept in contact with them all. And as our risk assessments have been worked through and adjusted as various things are, they have been released, they've been adjusted and we've told future guests and possible guests what we've been doing. Um, and then once people book, they will get that again and they will then get it again when they arrive. So they will know all the time and repeating what we're doing because often the email that people get before they arrive isn't read. So you want to make sure that they do know that what they see front is also happening at the back and the fact that their room has been cleaned to the level that they expect it to be cleaned. So it's making sure that all the things we're doing are being led to the guests repeatedly so that they do get to see and hear everything that's happening so that they do know they're safe before they arrive and when they arrive. Last question then, and there is no crystal ball and this may be a challenge to answer this, um, but what, what are your sort of hopes and aspirations for the next six months? Does anyone want to kick off with that one? Make it through. Yeah, not to lose Why not? Yeah. 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 Is, is, is it to keep your head above water? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yep. it. And, and I think to, to try and ensure we can keep employing as many people as we possibly can. Uh, and where, where do you think that point will be? Do you, you know, what's the point we need to get to where people finally say, that's it, it's fine, I can go to restaurants? Do, do you think there is a time period? Or no. is it going to depend on guidelines? Is it going to depend on... on... It depends on the people, because some aren't going to travel, to, some won't want to go out until there's a vaccine. Mm. Um, whereas there are others who don't really care, who are will be on the first possible plane they can to Spain. And I think that's going to be, there's, it's, there's a middle ground that will, that will travel comfortably and, and be cautious, but you're going to have the extremes where some people won't travel until there's a vaccine and others will be straight on an aeroplane as soon as possible. Listen, I for one, and I'm sure like a lot of people, and I'm sure you're, you're all exactly the same. I'm dying to go out. I'm dying yeah. to eat in a restaurant. Um, I cannot wait. You know, it sounds like you guys are doing all the right things. Um, it sounds like you've got bookings. You're talking to all of your audiences. Um, it, you know, as I say, for everything we're seeing on social media looks positive. None of us have a crystal ball, but I wish all of you every single success going forward. Um, and I hope at some point we go back to pre-COVID uh, trading um, and you can all go back to having successful businesses. Um, thank you all very, very much for your time. Anna, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to have you involved. Thanks. Marcos, lovely to meet you. Mike, super yeah. to meet you as well. Jamie, thank you very much for your time. You. And thank last you. but by no means least, Paul from the AA, thank you very, very much for your input. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Have a good day. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.